Hello, welcome back to the Juice Reading Project. This week I'm reading The Castle on Hester Street by Linda Heller, illustrated by Boris Kulikov. So let's start. One day, while Julia was visiting, visiting her grandparents, her grandfather said, Did I ever tell you about my good friend Moishi? You told me about Herschel, the famous astronomer, Julie said with a giggle. The one who, di- the one who discovered the moon is a matzah. And you told me about Bessie, your little cousin, whose braids were so long she used them for jump ropes. But you never told me about Moishi. Moishi... Moshi the goat was from my village in Russia. Julie's grandfather said he pulled the wagon I rode when I came to America. Not only could Moshi leap across oceans the way others could jump over puddles, but he could also sing. We started singing the moment we left Russia. 9,902 miles to go. 9,902 miles. After we passed that small patch of snow of 9,091 miles to go, and pardon my singing voice. Joy was about to join in when her grandmother said, So, what are you telling that child? A true story, just the way I remember, Rose dear. Julie's grandfather said, Moishi's wagon was solid gold. It shone like a shooting star when we flew over the ocean. That's a story, all right, but it's not true, Julie's grandmother said. Grandpa came on a boat like I did. It was terrible. Hundreds of families were crowded together. Babies were crying. Bundles were piled over. The boat rocked very much. I thought we would drown, but in Russia, life for Jews was very hard. We couldn't ever work where we wanted. Sometimes we were attacked just because we were Jews. We had to leave Russia any way we could. As her grandmother spoke, pictures grew in Julie's mind of her grandparents leaving the country and crossing the rock. A rough winter ocean on a boat so crowded they could hardly move. Grandpa, is that how you really came? Julie asked, looking sad. Yes, it was, Julie's grandfather said. He too looked sad until he added, but what a welcome I got when we when I arrived. President Theodore Roosevelt rode on his horse through a blizzard of ticker tape to believe to greet me. Hello, soul, he said. Mighty glad you you could come. Don't listen to another word, Julie's grandmother said. Grandpa Grandpa's brother Morris met him. The boat boat docked first at Ellis Island. We sat for hours and waited to be inspected. Not everyone who came could stay. If you were sick, you had to go back. I was, I was, I was so afraid that they would find something wrong with me. But thank God I passed every test. Hooray! Julie shouted. Thank you, dear. Julie's grandmother said. She gave her a kiss and said. I have something to show you. Then she went to the closet. Julie's grandfather leaned closer and whispered to Julie, Everyone who came here was given a castle. Mine was on Hester Street. It was so tall, the pigeons couldn't fly all the way up to the roof. I had to carry them there. Julie's grandmother came back to the sofa carrying a box. Did Grandpa tell you about the horrible little room he shared with Louie, the cigar maker, and Herman, the tailor? She asked as she sat down. In those days, people had to take in boarders to help pay the rent. Life was hard. Grandpa had a pushcart. He sold buttons 
opened 14 hours a day, six days a week. The only rest he got was on Sabbath. Poor Grandpa Julie said, she patted his hands. Julie's grandfather father was quiet for a moment. But then he said, but what buttons I had. Buttons carved from diamonds, emeralds, and rubies. Buttons as big as saucers. Buttons as big as plates. Buttons you could use as sleds in the snow. Julie's grandmother sighed loudly. Grandpa sold small buttons, small enough to fit through buttonholes. I'll show you, she said, as she opened the box. The box was filled with photographs. Julie's grandmother took out an old photograph with a cardboard frame. In it, Julie's grandfather stood next to his pushcart, which was full of little buttons. Grandpa looks so strong, Julie said, feeling proud. Julie's grandmother found a photograph of a young girl and showed it to Julie. This is a picture of your grandmother, he said. She was very famous in those days. Everyone spoke of Mr. Whitkin's beautiful daughter Rose, who stayed at home all day nibbling chocolates. Her five big brothers had to watch so that nobody stole her away. I worked six hours a week in a factory then sewing dresses, but I was very pretty, Julie's grandmother said, smoothing her hair. You are still very pretty, Julie's grandfather said, and he kissed her cheek. In Russia, your grandmother sold for royalty. She made the stitches so small they couldn't be seen. People wondered how the dresses stayed together. That part is true, Julie's grandmother said proudly. As soon as I met your grandmother, I wanted to marry her, Julia's grandfather said. Every night I hired fireflies to fly over her house and spell out, Rose, my precious flower, I love you every hour. And Moishi and I sang love songs under her window. Finally, her father let me marry her. A year later, your mother, Esther, was born. No one had seen such a beautiful child. Then Esther... Ruthie were born and they were just as beautiful. I made them tiny jeweled crowns as they rode through the streets and hand carved golden baby carriages. Um, I forgot to show the picture from the last page, so here it is. And here's the picture from this page. Enough is enough, Julie's grandmother said. From now on, I insist that Julie only hear the truth. Grandpa and I had to work even harder to feed all those babies. and the, But we didn't mind. We had something more valuable than jeweled crowns and golden baby carriages. We had each other and we were free to live as we wanted. That's the truth, Rose, dear, Julie's grandfather said. And from, and from now on, that's all that will pass through my lips. They sat quietly and smiled for a few minutes. Then Julie's grandfather smiled and whispered to Julie, Did I ever tell you about the time why she got the goat and I sang for President Wilson? And the end.